Kwe Kwe, bonjour, good evening everyone. My name is Richard Morehouse and I'm chair of the National Trust for Canada and with me is Dean Koga, president of the Association for Preservation Technology International. Welcome, benvenue to Capitalizing on Heritage, not for Capital, not for Patrimon. The Association for Preservation Technology International, or APT, it's a lot easier to say, is really thrilled to be um, co-hosting this conference with the um, National Trust of Canada. Many of you know that APT was actually born in Canada um, and in its early years shared the office space with the National Trust in Ottawa. And um, we've really come a long way since then to the point where we're co-hosting, is it the largest heritage conference in, in Canada? That's right, Dean. We have over 1,100 delegates from over 20 countries. It is appropriate that we're meeting here in Ottawa during Canada's 150th anniversary of our Confederation, a time of great celebration, but also an important time of reconciliation, which will ultimately make us a stronger and better country. Capitalizing on heritage prom prom promotes an extraordinary opportunity to explore the intersection of heritage policy and technical issues. Um, issues from macro to micro in scale with subject matter as diverse as cultural landscapes, non-destructive testing, heritage advocacy, engineering, sustainability, materials, digital tools, project financing, and so much more. It is now my honor to invite Arlene Kloster to offer an opening prayer and blessing. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to extend a warm and respectful greeting to each of you. I'm honored to have been invited to uh, do an opening prayer at this gathering. I would like to premise it by saying that prayer is a very individual thing and it can take many forms. Um, it can be that, that walk in nature where you visit the, the plant people and the animal people. It can be laughter with a child. For me, it's about giving thanks. So I would invite you to pray in your own way. Miigwech manito. Thank, thank you, Creator, for this gathering, for bringing everyone here safely, those from near and far. Miigwech to Mother Earth, who provides everything that we need to live a good life. Miigwech to Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, and all of the star people who watch over us. Miigwech Nibi, thank you for, to the water that sustains us. I think I'll end it there. Miigwech everyone. We're going to sing and drum an honor song. It's called the flag song.
switch. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Arlene, for your blessing and prayer. And let's give another round of applause to thank the wildflowers for their drumming and song. <laughs> Arlene and the wildflowers are both from Tewakinagan, the Algonquin First Nation whose territory is up the Ottawa Valley. Ottawa itself is built on the unceded ancestral territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. It has been a pleasure to meet and work with the Algonquin Anishinaabe First Nations from both sides of the Ottawa River in the planning of this conference. I would now like to invite Chief Kirby White Duck of the Algonquins of Pikwakinagan and Band Councillor Alice Boudouin of Kitigan ZB Anishinaabe to bring words of welcome to us on behalf of the Algonquin people. Please welcome Chief Kirby White Duck and Alice Boudouin. <laughs> Bonjour, greetings everyone. Uh, to Arlene and uh, the Pikwakanagan Wildflowers for that beautiful uh, prayer and song. Uh, thank you to Natalie Bull. She's uh, one of the coordinators for this uh, event. Uh, Chris Weeb and uh, Richard Morehouse, uh, the chair. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I would also like to thank uh, uh, and say that I got to meet uh, John Ralston Saul. Jimmy Gwetch, welcome. Um, from all four directions, east to west, north to south, and uh, we, the Anishinaabe people, have uh, our own name for this land, Turtle Island. Our ancestors' presence is felt everywhere on this vast landscape, and um, right here in this region, our history is very much connected to the Ottawa River and the Ottawa River watershed, which we traditionally call Kitasibi. Nisagiwan, this word, uh, this was the word used for traveling down the river. Canoes were used to come here to meet and talk with the uh, Wapshkiwe Ogima, that's the uh, white chief. And we call our chief uh, Ogima. And uh, there was uh, many uh, trips made down the, uh, the rivers, uh, many meetings uh, that took place between uh, all the, the leaders. Of course, today we have uh, come here by plane, trains, and automobiles. At the Ottawa International Airport, there was a birch bark uh, canoe uh, built by uh, a gentleman uh, named Patrick uh, Miranda. Uh, have some of you uh, seen it? Yeah, okay. He's my great grandfather. He's a master craftsman at building canoes, and uh, there are many uh, Anishinaabe uh, men like him in our communities. Uh, I acknowledge our ancestors, Jimmy Gwetch. I think it's uh, quite fitting that the, air, uh, that the uh, canoe is there at the airport. It re represents our history together, uh, us as Nishabe and uh, Canadians and newcomers to this land. On behalf of uh, Chief and Council of Kitagan it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to unseated um, Anishinaabe Algonquin Territory, Jimmy Gwetch. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, on behalf of the uh, members of the Algonquin, the Pequawakanagan First Nation, I uh, welcome you to uh, this conference uh, being held, as uh, Alice said, on uh, unsurrendered Algonquin Territory. 
Uh, just uh, a couple of items of interest, I guess, is um, it's uh, Algonquin's of Pequaquanagon, and that means hilly place. We're about 90 miles west up here, uh, just up river a bit, then along the Bonshe River, one of the tributaries of, uh, of the Ottawa, uh, right on Golden Lake. And if you're ever on Golden Lake, and you look around, you'll understand why it's called, it means hilly place. So Pequaquanagon means hilly place, so go to the Algonquin's of the hilly place. And uh, it's just one of the one of the bands, one of the Algonquin uh, First Nations of the uh, larger Algonquin Nation, which uh, basically occupies the uh, the Ottawa River watershed. All the uh, lands watered by the rivers, lakes, streams, flowing into the Ottawa River, um, up towards Lake Temiskaming. The source of the uh, Ottawa is, is is basically north of here. Hooks, hooks way around over towards Nate, North Bay, then down towards here, Pembroke, and this area here. And uh, it's quite a huge territory. I'll show you a bit more about the later in the presentation, uh, the extent of the territory and our, our past presence, I guess, as well as our current presence uh, of where we are today and that uh, we still occupy and use the territory, even though it's uh, largely populated by over, uh, over a million people now. And then there is a, a lot of history behind that. That hopefully you have enough time later on to um, to tell us who we are, where we are, and I guess some idea where we've been. And so I will take the opportunity along with Alice to uh, expand on that further. So again, welcome, and I'm very happy to be here, and and glad to uh, contribute some to your uh, to your session and to uh, to the event. And hopefully, uh, as the uh, uh, part of the conference theme, I guess, is to incorporate more indigenous elements into uh, into our territory than has been, than we've been given the opportunity in the past, which has been very little. So, again, welcome. Thank you very much. Sincere thanks, Ms. Welch. We look forward to learning more about Algonquin history and territory from Chief Kirby, and from Councillor Alice Boudin uh, later, and also during the Indigenous Heritage Roundtable tomorrow. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Mark Chris Manson of the National Capital Commission to welcome delegates to the National Capital Region. Good evening, uh, bonsoir, Pue Kakina. I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Chief Kirby White Duck and Councillor Alice Baudouin. Uh, also, Ms. Kloster, Mr. Koga, Mr. Morehouse, Ms. Ms. Bull, Ms. Quinster, Mr. Saul, our, our keynote speaker, and also all the con conference chairs and distinguished guests. Um, it really is a pleasure for me to invite you all here to Canada's capital uh, for this conference. Uh, bienvenue, c'est un grand plaisir de vous accueillir ici. Uh, the National Capital Commission is the uh, chief planner and steward of the federal lands and buildings in uh, Canada's capital, and as such, we are very involved in heritage conservation, and we're very proud to be a sponsor of this conference. I'd like to congratulate Natalie Bull and her team for putting together such a splendid program. Uh, and I'll just say that uh, as CEO of the, the National Capital Commission, I've put all of our staff sort of at your disposal to uh, to help in tours and to, and to look at assets uh, through the, uh, the capital that you might have interest in. Conserving our heritage is a key element of our new plan for Canada's capital 2017 to 67. Uh, this was launched in the spring as a signature initiative to mark the 150th anniversary of Canada's confederation. Uh, over 20,000 Canadians participated in its creation and I, I found it very encouraging that uh, Canadians view heritage preservation as an essential element in their capital in the coming uh, decades. Certains des projets marquants font l'objet de discussions et des visites cette semaine, en particulier celui de renouvellement de la cité parlementaire. Ce plan est véritablement le plan des gens, élaboré en collaboration avec les dizaines de milliers de citoyens d'une autre chaîne à l'autre à l'autre. Uh, par son entremise, vous pouvez constater que la conservation et la protection de notre patrimoine n'est pas seulement la priorité pour la Commission de la Capitale nationale 
uh, mais tous les Canadiens partagent cette priorité. W one of the themes that runs through this 50-year plan that will take us from the sesquicentennial to the bicentennial um, is that the capital of the 21st century should be meaningful and inclusive. And uh, out of this discussion with Canadians came the idea that, that the honoring of our indigenous traditions and culture is fundamental, fundamental to this definition of inclusivity. Now, indigenous placemaking is already central to many of the NCC's initiatives, and the spirit of mutual respect and reconciliation is woven into our mandate to build a better capital. And it is always an honor to share the stage with uh, Chief Kirby White Duck and, and also uh, Chief Jean D. White Duck from uh, Kitty Ganzibi. Uh, they're extraordinary leaders and they're great partners in, in our work at the NCC. I'm also delighted that we have John Ralston Saul with us as our keynote speaker. Uh, he's a gentleman with whom I've had uh, many spirited conversations about the built form of the Capitol. Uh, he's lived in Rideau Hall, and, uh, which is one of the official residences under the stewardship of the National Capital Commission, and really uh, uh, one of the nation's heritage treasures. So you have uh, experience uh, in, in, in many ways to talk about uh, the built heritage, and especially here in the capital. Il a des intérêts et des opinions marquées, et j'ai hâte d'entendre pendant l'exposé aujourd'hui. I'm also glad that uh, delegates will have a chance to explore some of the Commission's assets and initiatives as part of the conference, uh, including Gatineau Park. Uh, I know some people visited the Strutt House this morning. It's one of our uh, signature confederation of civilians for the 150th anniversary uh, of Canada. I, I think also there's some visits uh, on our initiatives in urban agriculture. Um, in fact, heritage restoration will be a great legacy of the NCC for the 2017 sesquicentennial celebrations. Uh, John, you will be glad to know that at Rideau Hall, we have uh, brought the dairy building back to life as a beautiful pavilion de devoted to winter sports at the skating rink. Uh, we've redone the forecourt of Rideau Hall and the beautiful new entrance doors. Um, those of you from Ottawa, w I think, will welcome the revitalization of the O'Brien House at Meech Lake. Uh, the 50 Sussex, the Strutt House I mentioned, the Moore Farm, the Log Farm, the Maison Charon in Jacques Cartier Park. All of these are heritage assets that uh, have been really brought back to life uh, uh, for this year and we hope for the future. And finally, on Victoria Island, we have the Commission and Minitig Pavilion in the old Bronson Company headquarters that Chief Kirby and, uh, and uh, uh, his community and um, have created as a beautiful pavilion and I hope people will go down and see the uh, Algonquin culture uh, on display in this wonderfully reconditioned 19th century uh, property. From 1967, uh, the NCC has, has left uh, a legacy of the Mile of History on Sussex Drive just outside. I think it's a wonderful legacy. Uh, we talked about it last night. Some of you may have been at our session on the legacy of 67, but we're proud that one whole block of that uh, mile of history is being renewed as part of the sesquicentennial, including the new building at Seven Clarence. That's the International Pavilion, uh, do drop by. And this will be, I think, a, a also a great legacy that resonates with, uh, with 67. So I hope you enjoy the historic ambience of the capital. Uh, our green spaces, uh, good weather, I hope, and I hope the conference uh, leaves everybody uh, energized and uh, motivated to keep up the cause of uh, heritage preservation in Canada and, and also in other countries abroad. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Megwich. See, thank you, Mark, for making us feel so welcome uh, in, in, in Ottawa. And as well, I want to thank you for hosting Heritage circa 1967 last night. I know that it was enjoyed by many of the delegates of the conference, so thank you again. So we are also pleased to be presenting this historic gathering in association with the a Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals, a valued co-conspirator of long standing. And I will now ask CAP President Roseanne Moss to come to the podium. And as Roseanne is coming to the podium, I'm going to ask all the board and staff of the National Trust, the Association of Preservation Technology International, and the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals to stand and be recognized.
Thank you for all the hard and wonderful work that you do in, in the cause of heritage conservation. And at this point, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite APT's new executive director, Paul Kinsner, um, to join us on the podium. And um, he's going to join us in thanking our conference sponsors. Thank you, Dean, and good evening, everyone. We are deeply indebted to our sponsors who are such an important part of this conference. There are many of them and they each deserve their moment in the spotlight, but please uh, hold your applause to the end. I'll start with our platinum sponsors. Uh, first, Algonquin College, At Will Morin, Syntec, Kime, Parks Canada, and vertical access. Roseanne? I'll continue with the gold sponsors. Thank you so much, um, all of you, and there are many. Agilian Allen Rebelli Limited, AAR, uh, Allback, Architectural Resources Group, Asor Restoro, Back Architecture and Planning, PLLC, and Visit Buffalo, Niagara. Carleton University, Carleton Immersive Media Studies, Studios, sorry, Cathedral Stone, DFS Inc. Architecture and Design, Evoke Architecture, Government of Canada, Heritage Grade, Historic Plaster Conservation Services, Iconoplast Designs, Plaster Preservation, John Canning and Company, John G. Cook and Associates, National Capital Commission, Ojervik Engineering, Pullman, RJW Stonemasons, Robertson Martin Architects, Inc., U.S. Heritage Group, and Wiss Janney Elsner. Thank you so much. And our silver sponsors, and please forgive me if I mangle your names, um, Apparam, ARA, Atkinson Nolan Associates, Architecture 49 Inc., Beak, BGLA Architecture, Bull Wealth, Clifford Restoration, Colonial Building Restoration, Treasure, Trevor Gillingwater Conservation Services Inc., Conrad Schmidt Studios, Conservation Solutions, The Chrisman Company, Dan Lepore and Sons Company, D2 Biological Solutions, Dubois, Darwin Terracotta Limited, Edison Coatings, Inc., Evergreen Architectural Arts, Faminella and Associates, Goldsmith Borgall and Company Limited Architects, Heritage Building Solutions, King, Heritage Mill Architectural Joinery, Integrated Conservation Resources, Inc., Integrated Conservation Contracting, Inc., Ibex North America, Jablonski Building Conservation, J.D. Strachan, Maurer Investment Management, McCallum Sather, MTBA Architecture, Urbanism and Conservation, Ontario Heritage Trust, PCL Construction, Perkins and Will, Pilkington, Prosico, Rainville and Frere, R. Olden Marshall and Associates, Sillman, Smith and Barber Sculpture Atelier Inc., Saint Denis Thompson, Stantec, STGM Architects, T Tacoma Engineers, Traditional Cut Stone, The Venton Group Architects, Void Span and WSP Canada. And now the bronze sponsors A Plus Link Architecture, American Institute of Architects, ATA Architects Incorporated, Athabasca University Heritage Resource Management, Boston Valley Terracotta, BVH, Canso Investment Council Limited, CRC Press. Rutledge Taylor and Francis Group, Don Luxton and Associates, Ekin Consultants LLC, Eco Strip, Edwards Heritage Consulting, Ellis Don, Cladding McBean, Logs End Reclaimed Wide Plank Flooring, Municipal World, North Country Slate, 
Old Structures Engineering, Pier 21 Asset Management Incorporated, Quinn Evans Architects, Roof Tile Management Incorporated, Simpson, Gumperets and Heger, Tornado ACS, Tirasima, and George Robb Architects. So a very sincere thanks to all of our sponsors. Many of them are here at the conference with us and have a blue sponsor ribbon on their delegate badge. You can check out all of our sponsors on the mobile map or in the program book, then seek them out in person and thank them for their support. So let's now give them a very good round of support. We could not have done this without them. Thank you. So we thank the sponsors again for making the conference possible. But um, we also have to thank the local conference committees for putting the conference together. And um, please join us in recognizing the hardworking local conference committee led by Chris Weeb and Mark Thompson Grant and th their amazing group of, of staff and volunteers. So um, I'd like you all to just stand up and um, we can acknowledge your hard work. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Natalie Ball to introduce our first keynote. Um, Natalie is director, executive director of National Trust, and um, I've known her for a long time, and I've had the honor and pleasure of working with her at APT in, in many different capacities. And um, I know that as a past uh, president of APT and as College of Fellows, um, it's terrific to be working with her to put on this conference together. So Natalie, could you come up? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Quay, bonsoir, welcome. As a proud dual citizen of APT and the National Trust, I'm thrilled to be part of this massive joint event designed to explore how people, policy, and preservation practice renew landmarks, create vibrant places, and protect what matters. I can't imagine anything more exciting than bringing these great organizations that I love together. So many wonderful friends and colleagues all collected in one place, so welcome. In our marketing materials for this conference, we sold Ottawa as the place to be in 2017 a beautiful historic capital in total party mode, celebrating a milestone year for our country. And yes, it is all that, but for many of us, as 2017 draws to a close, we are seeing this place and our country as an increasingly multi-layered construct, so much of it built on ancestral territory and branded with the names of erstwhile heroes. Across the country and beyond, Mythologies are being challenged and monuments are being toppled, literally and figuratively. And we in the heritage movement have the opportunity and the responsibility to be part of the conversation and to be agents for change. So during this opening plenary, we want you to hear from speakers who will provoke and question and help us see places through a different lens. Enter John Ralston Saul, an award-winning essayist and novelist whose works have been translated into 28 languages and 37 countries, John Ralston Saul is a provocative public intellectual and a prolific philosopher who plies his trade in both fiction and nonfiction. Mr. Saul has written extensively on Canadian identity, history, globalism, international politics, the crisis of modern power, and freedom of expression. As co-chair of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, a national charity promoting the inclusion of new citizens, he founded the Institute's LaFontaine Baldwin Symposium, a national lecture event that showcases leading Canadian and international thinkers and invites Canadians to join the national conversation on citizenship and the public good. A sharp-tongued and articulate proponent of Canadian values, his writing helps Canadians examine and reformulate our mythologies 
and revisit our collective story. Case in point, his 2008 national bestseller, A Fair Country, Telling Truths About Canada, which argues that Canada is a Métis nation, heavily influenced and shaped by Aboriginal ideas and held back by our failure to recognize Indigenous peoples as a founding pillar of our country. Declared a prophet by Time magazine and included in the Utney Reader's list of the world's 100 leading thinkers and visionaries, his ideas have influenced political and economic thought in many countries. So brace yourselves, dear colleagues, because we've asked this shrewd visionary to bring his extraordinary intellect to bear on themes that matter to our work with historic places. How ideas of place, physical remains, history, and national mythologies intersect. John Ralston Saul. Thank you. Well, um, I just think of myself as a very calm, sensible person. I don't know, I don't know why I'm thought to be controversial, but uh, Chief White Duck and uh, Councillor Baudouin, thank you very much uh, for welcoming us and the presidents of both National Trust and APT. It's a great honor uh, to be here. Um, you know, this is indeed the 150th anniversary of Confederation, which was um, one step along the way to whatever it is that we are today. Um, there are always people who organize parties which have political overtones who believe that it's just gonna be balloons and fireworks and nice speeches. Um, I think we're very, very fortunate in Canada that nobody agrees about that or many other things. And that, you know, major national celebrations in Canada uh, are meant to be moments of national debate. Often uncomfortable, often disagreeable, real debate, real questioning. And I think it's almost a pity we don't have more national celebrations in order to uh, become more and more uncomfortable with what we think is true and uh, raise a whole pile more questions because that's how you progress. That's how you do new things by asking yourself questions. You don't progress. It's, I mean, I'm not against the fireworks. I love fireworks. I love parties. But uh, that's not how you progress. That's just a fun thing to do uh, once the sun goes down. And it's a great opportunity for elected people to give speeches. Um, you know, so be it. Good. Um, but we shouldn't be uncomfortable what, with what's been done during this year because I think it's been a very cleansing, a very opening, a very, uh, as if we're on a wave to some new things, we're not there by any means. And I think, you know, now, it, you, you think 10 years ago, you think now, and people say, well, this is also Turtle Island. 10 years ago, indigenous people have been saying that for how long? And no one was listening. Now people are listening. Uh, now people actually, uh, are very comfortable with the land acknowledgement, which you know started to be accepted by non-indigenous people in, in, on the prairies, and now is you know become normal in central Canada. But you know, I sometimes think that we haven't quite reached the stage of what it is that's actually happening. That you know, uh, there was the elder gave uh, a very moving uh, blessing. We had an honor song. We talked quite rightly about being on uh, the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation. And um, nobody got up and left. Uh, they would have 100 years ago. You know. uh, and, but nobody actually, you know, so that must mean you agree. I mean, there are Americans in the hall. How many Americans are here, by the way? Just out of yeah, quite a few. So, you know, a lot of this is, uh, is interesting to you because, because of Indigenous people's place in the American debate is both the same and very different because the nature and history of the two countries is so different. Um, if you can sit through a land acknowledgement and feel okay, what you're actually doing is letting go of the idea that Canada is the inheritor of British and French legal traditions. You're actually letting go to some extent of the idea in British law and French law, uh, which we supposedly have in our country, um, although we don't really, um, 
uh, that you know, if somebody owns land, they own the land. They got the land, they own the land. It's their land. They can do what they want with it, you know, within the law and within some, some rules, unless you can either bribe or convince somebody to change it for you. Um, but this land acknowledgement is really saying, that it's not a romantic little thing of saying this used to be and we want to be polite about it. It's actually, uh, tell me, Chief, if I'm wrong about this and Councillor, I mean, it's actually saying, no, we don't actually agree with British common law or civil code about the nature of ownership and what you can do with ownership. We actually are accepting in Canada that land can be related to in many different ways and that the human relationship to land is not the European rational Greek Platonist idea of the human beings put in charge of the place and they can do whatever they want with it if they own it. That in fact, maybe we're accepting the idea that human beings are part of the place, not in control of the place. And being part of the place means that we have responsibilities. Again, Councillor and Chief, tell me when I'm off track here. Um, you know, that we, we actually have responsibilities and they're, they're partly environmental responsibilities, but they're more than that. They have to do with the relationships of people and place and the relationship of human beings in the place as opposed to above the place. And there are many, many words, and I don't know the Anishinaabe words for it, but in Cree, it's Wittiskewan. Uh, in Ahauzit, it's, uh, um, well, out of my mind it goes. It'll come to me in a minute. And these are words which are completely different concepts from the idea of this is mine, I'm in charge, I can do what I want with it. And you, you can certainly see where I'm going because the whole argument about heritage and the relationship between profit and heritage is all about who owns it, who's in control, who gets to say what can be done. This is a completely different approach from uh, the indigenous approach, which has within it multiple relationships and responsibilities. Uh, and it, it, you, know, you can almost read into it that of course there will be an understanding of placement, of uh, a certain modesty, of human beings vis-a-vis -vis place. And out of that comes an ease, I think, for talking about things like what materials should be used, what shapes, uh, what is the relationship between built form and history, um, uh, what is the relationship between built form and mythology. You know, in the money world, people don't take, and in fact, in the political world, people don't take mythology all that seriously. Mythology is about truth. Mythology is finding a way of telling a story about what really happened in a way that economists can't and political scientists can't. It's about what is the true story? How do human beings fit together with their past and with the place? How do the thousands of years of uh, indigenous stewardship fit together uh, with the settlers, particularly given that in the sort of since 1560 or so when the settlers started arriving, that for the next 300 years, indigenous people were the majority. They were leading the way. It wasn't just where we got here, people like me, and we were helped through the first winter. That's the kind of impression you get. It's centuries of working together under the stewardship or in partnership with indigenous people until you get into the 19th century when we're people like me are numerous enough that we start to betray every single agreement we could possibly betray and to act as badly as colonial powers can possibly act. And now we're, I think, trying, many of us, to put it back together again in some way. And we're helped by people like the Supreme Court who've given victory after victory after victory. I mean, it's interesting for you in the United States to hear this. I mean, I don't know how many victories it is that indigenous people have won in the last 30 years, probably close to 30. I mean, it's, you know, in terms of poker, nobody has ever had a run like this. And uh, you can be unhappy with some of the victories, they wouldn't go far enough, but actually it is an amazing, not rewriting of Canadian history, but discarding of the colonial history by the Supreme Court with, frankly, the politicians, the civil servants, and the, 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 the voters running way behind and now trying to catch up as best they can to this reestablishment of a kind of order which existed for centuries and centuries. Um, so it is a form of truth. And, uh, and I have to say that, you know, in my, I never 
you know, I can only speak as a non-indigenous person to non-indigenous people. That's the only way I can do this. But I'm, you know, indigenous people will say exactly what they want to say. And they've been saying it louder and longer uh, than any of us can really even understand today. But I, I have to say that, you know, I was very lucky from the age of about 26 or so on that I was put in the presence of a whole series of fantastic people who began to tell me what I hadn't been told at school. Now kids are starting to learn a little bit better at school, and I was very influenced by um, Elder William Commanda. Mottawa was a great man, a truly great man, and I remember when I first met him, I thought, gosh, I think a lot of people, when they met William, they thought, gosh, you know, this is a very strong figure with a st very strong vision of what this area should be. So um, let me just say that, I mean, you know, if he were speaking, or I think if many people were speaking, they would, and many historians, non-Indigenous, would say that what's so interesting about being in Ottawa, for those of you who aren't from here, whether you're Canadian or American, is that you are, in effect, um, on the great highway of the northern half of North America, the great highway that, uh, which, whichever way you're going on it, uh, will take you into the heart of the northern half of the continent. And I, when I was talking about, well, what, what was I going to talk to you about today, Chris and others said to me, why don't you talk about the larger vision, the larger issue. I mean, you have to see, not simply heritage, built form, all of that work, you have to see it in this larger context, the role of water. You heard already from many of the indigenous speakers that the role of water is at the core of what this country is in a way that it is not in Europe or the United States. That you know, water, rivers in Europe were essentially like uh, walls dividing armies, conquering armies, representing races and religions and so on, as opposed to this place where the geography was so difficult, the only way you could move around was on water, and the waters were the things that joined people together. And that the history, in fact, of the northern half of North America has been uh, the, 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 the you moved through the waters. Canada is the only colony of any of those European empires over the last 500 years where when the imperial forces arrived and the settlers, they uh, were obliged to continue to use the indigenous means of transportation for centuries. Whereas in the United States, to a great extent, except in the northern part, which is sort of like Canada, um, you know, uh, it, people moved as fast as they could to, to horses and cavalry, and they conquered with cavalry, and they had wheels and so on. Try a wheel in the, in the Canadian Shield. You know, last about one second. You know, canoes were the way. And so for hundreds and hundreds of years, the, the, the canoe in its different forms continued to be the means of communication of the country. Um, long after we'd become a real democracy in 1848, it was still a country held together by water. And we went straight from water to trains. We're one of the only countries in the world which went from, not from water uh, to roads and then trains, but from water to trains and uh, roads came third. And this tells you a lot about how you have to think about the land in this place and how uh, it worked. And in that sense, and I remember both uh, the chief and the council talked about this. I mean, Ottawa is very much a, a natural capital of Canada because it is such an essentially important place. On that highway, it was always an enormously important place of Algonquin people, a meeting place. Uh, Chaudière Falls were like the last uh, leap from the south into the beginnings of uh, the north, into the center of the continent, and of course, an incredibly important sacred site, Chaudière Falls. I mean, long after the industrial sites were put there, people were still doing tobacco ceremonies well into the 20th century at the falls. I mean, probably pretty awkward given what the, the uh, log booms were like, but uh, it, it was done. Um, and, and we're still not at the stage where we understand what all that means. There's still that statue of Champlain up on Nepean Heights, you know, and he's sort of nobly kind of pointing up the river in a Boy Scout way, sort of saying, come on, boys, follow me. You know, 
the courageous, and that he was actually quite an intelligent fellow, but the courageous uh, explorers, whereas in reality what he's saying is he's turning around to uh, Algonquin and Wyandotte and he's saying, guys, where are we? Where are we going? Are you sure we should go that way? It looks pretty tough. I mean, I don't know, we just have to change that statue so that the message of it is a little clearer, frankly. Um, and so that 100 years of industrial use uh, in the middle of the river is really just a, a hiccup in the real history of this river and of this city and of this settlement. Um, it's actually interesting because it's a city which is of, you could say, two sacred circles. There's the Algonquin indigenous sacred circle centered on the falls, and then there's the Canadian, if you like, sacred circle centered on a parliament. But it's the same circle, interesting enough. It just has its, its soul in two different uh, places. It's, it's, it's an identical uh, circle. And um, it, it, this, this whole idea of the rivers and the water and, what, and the implications of what, how communications would work, how people would relate to each other, is very, very important because, in fact, um, uh, it was based to a great extent on trust, on gatherings in the summer when people negotiated long-term relationships and when the fur trade started. The fur trade was entirely structured around indigenous principles. The settlements were structured around indigenous settlements. Every major city in Canada except Regina is built where there was and is a major indigenous settlement. There's no exception to that. It's, it's astonishing. It's not just Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, and so on. They're all built. The country is still conceived as indigenous people conceived it in spite of those, that 100, 150 years of the trail. And, and out of that, it's interesting because out of that whole concept of a place shaped by water, um, through uh, a guy called Harold Innes, great philosopher uh, who did a history of the fur trade and came to understand the spatial uh, nature of and the indigenous nature of the fur trade. Out of that came the first books on modern communications, the bias of communication, and out of that came Marshall McLuhan. The whole contemporary idea of modern communications can be traced back to the indigenous peoples of the northern half of North America. And McLuhan was kind of the, the filter for getting it out to the rest of the world. The way in which we see each other comes through a great deal of that. Canadians are not yet there, and the United States is not at all there in terms of giving credit where credit is due. Because this has an enormous impact on the work of the National Capital Commission. And if Mark, if I have to say the one, I, uh, you know, with my wife was thrilled to be, I guess we were partly leaders in redoing that house and making it the great Canadian house and again the great Canadian garden. But what you didn't do was give me credit, and I very rarely ask for this, but give me credit for doing, making one major change in the National Capital, which was to lead the fight to get that roundabout between 24th Sussex and Rideau Hall, which was opposed by just about everybody because they wanted traffic lights. And the feeling was that people in Ottawa going to their offices in the morning couldn't turn around a circle early in the morning without having an accident. And um, they were a lot of unhappiness about having to turn the wheel. Um, but now it seems to be okay. People have said, well, instead of having three coffees, I'll have two and turn around the roundabout. So I'm very proud of that, you know. Um, anyway, uh, I think uh, what I'm uh, trying to talk about here is, is, is how much difficulty we're having still dealing with the human relationship when it comes to designing how our societies work. Um, and that's why I mentioned Widdiskewin and the Ahauzit word, which is Tsawak. Um, let me give you an example of how it works and doesn't work. Paris, most beautiful city in the world, there's no question about it. Um, uh, it's a centralized city. It's a circle. It's like a pie cut in s slices. It's got, got roads and circles going around the outside of it, and at the core of it lies power and beauty and all the rest of it. Um, and this was all accomplished, actually, in the second half of the 19th century by Baron Haussmann, who was put in charge of redoing the city. And he came in and he ripped down the whole center of the city, which is where poor people live, and replaced that with buildings for middle, upper middle class people, the, new, new, the nouveau riche of uh, the Third Empire and the Third Repub uh, 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 Republic. Um, 
And what all the poor people did was, of course, they had, were forced to simply walk away. They were expelled and walk until they got to a place where nothing was built. So you got all around the defended walls of Paris these hovels, which turned into the base of the Communist Party of France. It's called the Centre Rouge, the Red Belt um, around Paris. And what's fascinating is that they've never changed their relationship to people and planning, so that they continue to build uh, in a way which shoves the poorest people to the outside. So that the crisis in the uh, suburbs in the north are in fact the direct engineered result of a planning policy, going back to Baron Houseman, which shoves the newest arrivals and the poorest people to the end of the train line or whatever. So those are those you know, very unhappy, very far away uh, suburbs. So that's a classic example of a Platonist, uh, Western dominant human being saying, we're gonna shape this city this way, we're gonna put the rich people in the center, we're gonna put the poor people in the edges, and out of that has come enormous disorder in France. And they're just starting to have the conversation about whether this is the right way uh, to go about it. And what about North America? Well, we all know in the United States and Canada that our approach towards the built form, in spite of all our attempts at planning and our rules and the National Capital Commission, all these things all over the place, we're actually a pretty brutal lot. And uh, we really have spent much of the 20th, half second half of the 20th century hauling out the centers of our cities it, it, because we own them. Or somebody owns them, we have the right to rip them down to try and make larger profits out of doing something different at the center. And as we know, for half a century, it's been relatively catastrophic in a large number of cities because they've hollowed out the centers of the cities. This was not an accident. This was the result of the idea that human beings following a Platonist tradition had of their right to do what they wanted with the place. And that anything other than that was soft and really not acceptable in a free uh, market society. And these cities were treated that way because of an obsession uh, with short-term profit. It wasn't about capitalism versus socialism or some silly, arcane uh, attempt to divide things in that way, as some politicians try to do. Can't pick who. Um, it, 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 it really was an obsession with the idea that if, if somebody owns it, they can do what they want and that the right kind of profit is the maximum profit in the short term. And it really doesn't matter what happens to the city in the medium or long term or the people who live in it. So one of the um, uh, results of that is that the battle which people like you, people in this room, have been fighting, the heritage battle, it's already the wrong word, frankly, um, is that you are reduced to the opposition of that. Every time you want to save something, you're actually saying you have to make less money to the people who think they own it or want to own it. So this is what's called Manichaeism. It's, 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 it's binary. It's artificial. It's, you're trapped so that every time there's a discussion about an interesting or important piece of natural land or a building, suddenly people like the people in this room are put in a defensive position of saying, well, you're going to have to the other side. You're going to have to give up your profits or part of your profits. You're going to have to give up and sacrifice something in order for more money to be made because that is our God-given right to make uh, more money. It's reductionist. It's frankly barbaric. And it's interesting that in cities like Paris, which are relatively settled, these things are no longer allowed. You know, if a building, if a six-story, I know I was in the business in Paris when I was a child. Um, uh, you know, if a six-story building that you own burns down, you have the right to replace it with one story. It's, it's one to one. You don't get six again, and you certainly don't get seven or eight or nine. Um, you know, so those cities are kind of fixed, and they've got very strict rules. In North America, we're still acting as if we're in the 17th or 18th century with this reductionist barbar uh, barbaric model that if we can get an ownership, we can rip this down, and the rules are not all that strict. Um, it's incredibly Manichaean, uh, and it's really about, on the one side, there's ownership and profit, and on the other side, it's public space, and it's a sacrifice and lost profit. And there's very little ground in between. That's what's really fascinating, is even today, 
there's very little ground in between, in spite of the fact that this opposition, which I've described, which is exactly the opposite of the indigenous philosophy, which I described at the beginning, this idea of opposition between profit and public is artificial, and it's not true. Uh, even by reductionist standards, it's not true. Uh, it, these places of public value actually are the things which create the values in the city. You take those away and the private spaces turn into slums very, very fast. Because if you don't have the parks, you don't have the public buildings, you don't have the museums, you don't have the celebration places, all you've got is condos. And there's nothing, and it becomes a money-losing, poverty-stricken place. So the value of the public spaces is gigantic, and it is therefore not a sacrifice. It, you're not defending something which is undefendable because it's going to cause people to lose money. You're actually part of increasing the value of the private sector. So progress is not, and has never been in Western history, truly about an increase in direct profit. Um, so the sophisticated view, which I've just described, the relatively sophisticated view of Western philosophy and, 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 if you like, ethics, is directly in line with the sophisticated view of indigenous peoples. There is no fundamental difference. The difference is between the unsophisticated Western view, which is the Manichaean binary view, and the indigenous uh, philosophies. And I can give you tons and tons of examples of, you know, slightly different things. I mean, it was, you know, Haida Gwaii, wonderful mystical islands off the north of uh, uh, Vancouver Island, uh, dominated fortunately by the Haida and, and, and some newcomers. Um, the southern half of it is a park. The old model under Parks Canada was Parks Canada gets it, everybody's out, it's just, you know, a place that people can visit. And the Haida refused this, there was a very tough negotiation, and in the end, it was the first joint managed park in Canada, and it's one of the greatest parks in Canada, and the Haida really run it. And you can't get into the park unless you go and spend time basically passing a test under control of the Haida. I complained bitterly the first time, you know, a typical writer. I complained bitterly, and then I got in there, and, and it was uh, uh, one of the Gladstones, and of course, they, they couldn't get me out of there because, of course, it was so interesting. Instead of just walking into a park where I didn't know anything, I was suddenly in the hands of people who knew an enormous amount and were going to allow me to go into that park in an intelligent manner, as opposed to goofily, the way most Canadians do, you know, getting out of the city into a park. Oh, that's a tree. What kind of tree is that? I don't know. Does anybody know what kind of tree that is? Oh, look at the turtle. What kind of turtle? I have no idea, you know. And suddenly you're in a place where actually it was managed by the First Nations and you were going in with them intelligently or reasonably intelligently. Um, Different kind of story. Victoria, capital of British Columbia, it pretends to be an English city, a complete nonsense idea. The English didn't really arrive there in any numbers until late 19th century. Um, and it's a sort of Disneyland of faraway Englishness. It's really one of the silliest things I've ever heard of as an idea. It's a wonderful place, but a silly idea. When in fact, of course, it's a First Nations Métis place, when in fact the whole southern half of British Columbia was opened up to settlers by First Nations and Francophone Métis, Francophone Métis, very Francophone British Columbia in terms of its opening up to settlers, when in fact the first serious government, Sir James, uh, Governor Sir James Douglas was half black, uh, out of the fur trade and his wife was a Francophone Métis. You know, th this is the story of British Columbia you don't really hear, but, but what's fascinating about the city is, is they're trying desperately to make money out of pretending to be English. I'm being unkind here, and so if there are people from Victoria, don't forgive me. But, um, whereas, of course, the single most famous person who came out of Victoria was Emily Carr, the painter, who was very close to indigenous peoples, and the single most famous woman painter in Canada, one of the greatest women painters, one of the greatest painters, period. Three houses that she lived in are still there. One of them is a bit of a museum, the other two in private hands. Nobody is thinking to themselves, if we could, the public interest could get a hold of all three of those houses for not much money. There are a thousand Emily Carr paintings and drawings in the museum there. You would be able to put together a, a museum in the three houses 
And this would be an enormous attraction, tourist attraction, serious attraction to Victoria. Much, much more money would be made out of uh, admiring and respecting Emily Carr than can possibly be made out of a couple of bagpipers and serving tea at the Empress Hotel. I can tell you. You know, it's a whole other approach towards what, you, and yet no money is available to support Emily Carr and to recognize her. In Montreal, the house of Louis Polite Lafontaine with Robert Baldwin, one of the two founders of Canadian, modern Canadian democracy in 1848. The Parliament of Canada set in Montreal from 48 to 50, 50 because it had to go because the anti-democratic forces burnt down the Parliament buildings. It was a very unpleasant evening. Um, <laughs> and tried to kill the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Governor General several times, so they left town and went to Toronto uh, with Parliament. But Lafontaine's house, right in the center of Toronto, or of, of Montreal, is one of the three places in which Canadian democracy was developed. It's not the house of a famous man that needs to be saved. It was in that house, in the Chateau Ramsay, and in the burnt down Parliament buildings, that Canadian democracy was imagined and put together. And all we could do, all we could do as a, as a country, was to have an argument about whether or not we had the right to take money and profits away from the owner of a square block on one side of which was Lafontaine's house. That how many square meters would this developer lose? How much would he have to be paid to give up the house where democracy was developed in Canada? Instead of that, I think they're gonna end up doing what in Toronto we call uh, facadism, which is you rip the whole place down and leave the facade. Um, and that's supposed to mean something, right? So, what did Montreal get out of it? I can tell you what Montreal got out of it. The, the, the developer, if this is what happens, will make a, a reasonable amount of money on a per square meter basis, and Montreal gets nothing out of it except a few taxes. Had it been kept and turned into a history of democracy museum, Montreal, the people of Montreal, would be making millions and millions of dollars out of tourism, of people coming and spending time, of people understanding the city in a different way. My point is that the other theory of how things run, the non manichaean theory, is actually not only the right thing to do historically and heritage-wise, it is actually a way to make much, much more money over a much longer period of time. Because it's the right thing to do, so money follows in a tertiary way. It's not a sacrifice, it's an intelligent um, thing to do. And so they're a great mistake. It's actually not only was democracy really put together in that house, but in 1849 when the mob was making their last try, try to overthrow democracy, uh, they came and attempted to uh, storm the house and to kill Lafontaine. And he couldn't get the police or the army to turn out, so he turned to one of his senior cabinet ministers, um, Etienne Pascal Taché, who was a colonel in the militia, and said, can you help? Cabinet ministers are not often called to upon to physically defend the prime minister. Um, so he brought about 12 of his friends with rifles and they defended the prime minister's house and there was a gun battle in which people were wounded and killed. And this all happened in this house. This is all just disappearing because we can't be bothered to imagine that there's a different way to think about preservation, not as if it's taking something away from somebody who in a British minimalist way owns something uh, and has the right to short-term value as a developer, so, and even though the city and the people will lose not only their history, but their longer term value. It is really the barbarism of facadism. Next door, not far away, there's a wonderful museum, if you, if those of you who haven't been, don't know Montreal, Ponte Calier, which is really a model of how a museum can integrate the role of indigenous people, of the settlers, of the history, and, and they're in the process of uh, trying to make sense of the burnt out remains of the parliament, which is just next door. They've done a wonderful job. They will bring so much more cash to the city than that developer who has ripped down the, the, one of the founding places of Canadian democracy. So that the financial model that is being used today is completely wrong. We're constantly forced into these money versus public memory, public good arguments, and it's a false argument. And, I'm not taking sides, I'm not, it's not my business, but you know, the whole argument in Ottawa around Chaudière Falls and those islands, it's, it's, it's not about whose side are you on. So I'm not taking sides. It's about the model which has been forced 
It's the way the debate has been structured. Are you for condos? Are you for the falls? As opposed to actually saying, you know, actually the same people, the developer, indigenous people, could make far more money over a longer period of time out of a park because millions of people would be coming to Ottawa for hundreds of years. Ceremonies, uh, meetings, and so on, as opposed to a few years of uh, money made out of building things. The same people would be making far more money over a far longer period of time by taking the logic of the sacred into the logic of what people really believe in and are interested in seeing and will spend money on, frankly. So it's the model which is at stake. It's not that somebody is evil and somebody's good. It's really the model that needs to be re-looked at and rethought of um, and, uh, and uh, reconsidered. So let me just finish by saying that it is incredibly difficult to convince Western civilizations, and we said it would be a good idea, um, to change the model, to actually not simply sit still when the land acknowledgement is read out, but to actually say that land acknowledgement means something. It means philosophically a different approach towards how human beings are going to live in a place and respect the place and make sense of the place. It's a much more sophisticated and complex model, the indigenous model, than the model which we are currently using, in which you are obliged to be the kind of losers in the battle of. You've got this sort of assigned position. You're allowed a few victories from time to time, but largely it's the losing. It's the virtuous position, if you like. Um, and it, it, it really would not be that difficult if we could understand it better for us to say, look, the indigenous model and the Western humanist model fit together. And actually, it's not only the right model for our society, it's not only a more interesting and complex and sophisticated model, but actually, more money will be made. Which surprises people when you say that, you know, but it is actually uh, true. And it helps us to move away from the short term, utilitarian, make a bit of money fast and then walk away. And you can see this kind of problem again and again. I can take you from city to city to city to city across the country. And you see these battles being fought out in a tedious way, always following the same model, always refusing the idea that something ethical, something sacred could actually also be linked to something profitable without the ethics uh, being um, lost. So there are many, many people writing about these ideas these, and I think of some of the great indigenous thinkers, Tayaki Alfred, he's, in, uh, he's, he's from um, uh, the East, but he's at, in Victoria. Silawat Fiche, the great Inuit uh, thinker who was the elected uh, head of all the uh, Inuit people around the North. Richard Atlio, one of my favorites, who's written um, about Sawak and the philo this very different philosophy. Leroy Little Bear, a great man, great, great man in Lethbridge who's you know, written endlessly about this clash of what he calls the jagged worldviews of indigenous and Western, which have become jagged because they've been shoved together, but that something interesting could come out of this. Um, I would just finish by saying that, that one of the things I talked to you about coming, it took an hour and a half to get here, coming from a little bit further north, um, two thirds of Canada is north of a dozen cities. Uh, the urban image of Canada Two-thirds of the country is north of that. It's not rural, it's something else. It's very, very interesting. And we have spent the last 150 years pretending the truth lies in these handful of southern cities imitating the Western, Manichaean, utilitarian, binary, Platonist model, and that we should apply this wherever we can and have that fight, which is the same as the fight in Europe or in the United States. And we've been very, very careful to ensure that there are as few universities as possible north of our cities, that uh, any studies of the north are done in the south, that hundreds of millions of dollars are spent every year in southern universities to study the north. No money's invested in the north. No, we're the only circumpolar country which does not have a university in the Arctic to make sure that no ideas can come out of the Inuit territories <laughs> to the south and somehow weaken us because we, won't, we can't hear anything that isn't European-based, which isn't Manichaean, which isn't utilitarian. And so we've, we've protected the southern view 
of uh, how this should all work, how money versus heritage or money versus the public good should fight with each other. And we've not opened ourselves up really to these other ideas which come out of the North. I think there is a desperate need to listen to the North, to fund institutions in the North. I mean, there's a university in Northern British Columbia, and then there's something in Sudbury, and, um, and, and um, uh, I should know, I have an honorary degree. Um, uh, <laughs> what's the city just near uh, Sudbury? Um, no, going the other way. North Bay, thank you. You know, in North Bay, the, 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 the president of no the University of North Bay is, in is First Nation, first one in, in, in Canada. I hope there'll be many more very soon. We have to be really investing in whether it's architecture, and I think there's a school coming maybe in Sudbury, uh, in architecture schools, in medical schools, in administrative schools, in language schools, because indigenous languages are one of the most precious and important things in this civilization, in our understanding of whatever is happening here. And that could only happen if there are universities, if there are schools, if there's much, much, much more money put into all forms of education led by indigenous people. And if we can do that, if we can bring ourselves to let go of the Southern control and the Southern model, I think we'll find very interesting new models coming out of the Arctic, coming out of North Bay, coming out of Prince George, coming out of Northern Canada, indigenous ideas, Northern ideas, which we are desperate for, frankly. We are in desperate need of in order to escape from this barbaric and simplistic reductionist battle which we're still involved with over what is private and what is public. We have to move towards much more modern, postmodern intellectual concepts which indigenous people are far more likely to have a handle on than people living in the do dozen southern cities. Magritte. Thank you. Thank you. John, you've been reading our mail. Oh, really? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. You, you really touched on many of the issues that, uh, that the people in this room grapple with uh, on a daily basis. Um, the relationship between money and values, um, the, the challenge of uh, pr preserving and managing property which exists in a complex context of law and finance and, and personal, the idea of personal rights. Uh, you may know that um, right now in Canada, the House of Commons Environment Committee is in the middle of a milestone study on the state of historic places in Canada. And so many of us have been making uh, submissions and appearing before the committee, sharing with them some of the issues that we see facing historic places and proposing some tools that uh, we, many of them gleaned from models in other countries that we think would help put historic places on a level playing field in Canada. Uh, and so it was really interesting partway through those hearings to uh, have um, an indigenous heritage organization talk to the committee and basically say it's too solitude. All the things that everyone's talking about really have no connection at all to the, the needs that indigenous people peoples have um, and the, the way that they think about places with value. So any thoughts from you on how institutions and movements like ours can move into a new way of thinking and being and, and being more inclusive of um, indigenous places that well, we want to. First it's who do you have involved? You know, you have to get indigenous people involved at the very core of your work. And you know, I named a small list of thinkers. I mean, there's a long list of thinkers who are indigenous thinkers who are writing about all this and saying these things. And I think, you know, if they're willing, if they have the time, they have an enormous contribution to make uh, uh, to help uh, Southern organizations rethink not you know, details, but rethink the parameters, the serious parameters. And, and I think you know, it's, it's, it's also, um, uh, you know, 
this is, this is not the moment to kind of go into an analysis of you know, the complexities of the department of what I still call Indian Affairs, because I think it still acts like the Department of Indian Affairs. Um, so I don't see why it should be renamed until it acts like something better. Um, you know, I don't know, is that fair? I don't know. <laughs> um, but you know, if you actually take, for example, uh, the fact that most, so many, how many, couple of thousand, I don't know, uh, communities in northern Canada don't have road access except in the winter or water access in the summer and their heating is all done by fuel oil, the most polluting fuel oil. So this is a structure. This is, a, this is not an accident. This is a structure where, you know, why not, you know, what I always said, why not take a, a pile of money out of Indian Affairs and create a, a indigenous led um, freestanding en engineering consultancy firm which will put together packages of, uh, of uh, how to produce fuel, uh, uh, energy rather, for isolated communities, reserves, isolated communities, and say, well, we're, this is a community that has you know, reasonably good wind, and it also has sun for part of the year, and it also has this, and all that. Put together a package, and, and you could change it radically. That would be a completely different way of thinking about it, and just get out of this old, uh, this old thing that we're stuck in. I mean, I remember being in a community in, in Nunavik, North, you know, in uh, Inuit community in northern Quebec, and they had a, a modern um, windmill, and it wasn't working. And so I asked why it wasn't working, and they said, "Well, Hydro Quebec really didn't want it to work because they want to build a 500-kilometer-long uh, line, electric line, because that's what they do. They're men; they do big things. <laughs> you know, they're not really interested in the idea of what could be done in the community." So, so it's, it's more than heritage, it's the whole approach towards community. All right. You mentioned the, the Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine house in Montreal. Right. It's on one of the, the sites on our list of the top 10 endangered places in Canada. And, uh, but, but what's interesting, I think, is that heritage advocates are often criticized for focusing on the, the houses of the elite, uh, and that we, we really need to uh, broaden our perspective and be uh, more inclusive of all kinds of heritage in the work that we do, and I think indigenous heritage is a part of that, of course. Yeah, and and, and of course, you know, the, the, what's important about the, as I said about the Lafontaine House, is it's not that it's the house of the elite; it's the house in which democracy was debated, where they all came together and they were safe and all the rest, of it, and they could talk about things. So enormously important things happened in that house. You know, we did away with primogeniture, the basis of the English class system as a result of debate in that house. We started to do away with the seniorial system. We started to create uh, uh, um, uh, uh, for democracy for cities. It didn't exist before that government. They did it, it happened in that house. The decision was made in that house. And there's this long list, this is where it happened. This is a sacred site. It's a sacred site. And we're treating it as, well, how many square feet is that? You know, right. What's it worth from a square meter point of view? And because of the model, you know, nobody could say, but do you realize that the value of the whole block that's going to be redeveloped would go up if you respected the value of that house? It wouldn't go down, it would go up. So actually, even the developer lost money by his approach. But he's so caught in the model that he can't see that there's another way of doing it. So a, a lot of this is, you, is changing the language, changing the arguments. And, the reason I, I probably said the words, you know, Manichaean, utilitarian, reductionist, binary about 20 times, and I'm doing that on purpose. It's not because I have a small vocabulary, <laughs> you know? I'm doing it on purpose. I, 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 what I'm saying to you is you've got to change the way in which you enter into the debates. You've got to go into the rooms and say to the developer, you've got a really stupid financial plan. You're going to make a lot less money than if you follow what we're suggesting. You've really got to change. You don't understand how value is created in the medium term. Now, if you just want to do an in and out, and the city's going to suffer, then why don't you admit it to the city that actually it's just an in and out, and everybody else is going to suffer, and you're going to go away and buy a condo in Florida? I mean, let's just have a frank conversation about this and see whether the, you know, the mayor is willing to defend that in public mm -hmm. when people start to understand what's really happening. Uh, tomorrow we'll be having the third in a series of Indigenous Heritage Roundtables where we bring Indigenous voices. We really create a space within our conference for Indigenous peoples to speak to each other about, about heritage and their perspectives 
uh, their, their worldview on places that matter. And I, I think those of us working in heritage are learning a lot about that perspective and that idea that our history, our values are written on the landscape uh, and they're written in our, in our buildings as well sure. as on our landscapes. Well, I think that's why I started by talking about the water system. In a sense, you don't need me up here. I mean, it, you know, I mean, there's this long list of people, indigenous people, who would say exactly the same things I'm saying or, and say them probably better. And, um, and I think that it's, it, you, know, we, you know, there's just an enormous amount to learn by listening um, at this stage. And I think people are starting to be ready to listen. Um, I think there's been a big breakthrough in the last, believe it or not, five years. It seems appalling it's only the last five years, but you can see some real changes um, taking place. And, um, and, uh, but it's, go it's going to require a big effort in the non-Indigenous population to say to themselves, what we're hearing is actually really valuable to all of us. It's not simply understanding the needs and demands and justified anger of indigenous people. It's also saying, actually, we could learn something here. We could change the way we're thinking about things here. There are some very valuable ideas here. I mean, I think Richard Atlio's book, uh, Tsawak, he's done two, uh, same name, different subtitle. The second one is one of the most valuable books of ideas and philosophy written in Canada in 25 years. And it would help people think differently about how they're doing that. And that's coming from the west coast of Vancouver yeah. Island, you know? So we will be hearing from Indigenous voices uh, next in the program tonight. Great. But, but you've been a very important voice in Canada, John, in, in bringing to the, the attention of a broader public the, the important uh, role of Indigenous heritage and Indigenous peoples in building our country. And uh, we thank you for that. Well, you, you, don't, you don't need to. I mean, sorry, you really don't need to. And I can tell you that this has been I, I, I'm always very nervous when I'm asked to talk about these things because it's not, you know, I'm only talking to the non-Indigenous people about it and maybe I have a way to say it. Did I get through to some people? <laughs> I don't know. You know, <laughs> maybe I could do that. Um, but all the way along, I just, you know, daily I'm talking to Indigenous thinkers and leaders. And <laughs> used to be when I was doing a fair country and I'd go across the country and I'd get to a town to give a speech. And I'd go to see whoever the, the grand chief was and say, you know, or the Métis president, and I'd say, I've been invited to do this, and I'm probably doing this tonight. Do you, do you mind if I do it? Uh, do you have any advice? Is there anything I shouldn't say or you'd like me to say? And after about 50 minutes, he'd get bored with me and say, for God's sake, John, just go out there and <laughs> try, because we've been trying for 100 years, and these people aren't listening. <laughs> so, I mean, see if you can make any progress. And um, if you can't, you can't. If you can, that's one thing done. But I mean. I think that you know one of the great breakthroughs, and uh, I, I, I don't know um, if others would agree, but I think one of the great turning points was Idle No More, when suddenly a whole new generation of young indigenous leaders came out in the middle of the winter. You know, I mean, I don't know if you Americans, the ones that some of you are from the south, but you know, you don't have protests in Canada in the middle of the winter all that much, right? <laughs> it's just not viable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Idle No More, you know, started in the prairies in, in the coldest time of year. And they did it in an incredibly peaceful, elegant, but tough way, went where they were not expected. And frankly, with most of those people when asked would have said, I don't think of myself as Canadian, which is fine. Um, but in fact, they were the most important defenders of Canadian democracy. In fact, if we turned a corner towards maybe a better time, I think we owe non-Indigenous people, owe it almost entirely to Indigenous people who showed through I don't know more that they would stand up and they would not allow what was being done to the protection of fish, what was being done to the protection of the water, what, all these things that were being taken away, and they wouldn't stand for it. So while at the same time rejecting the parliamentary system, they actually saved it in a way. And we all owe a deep debt of gratitude Frankly, I feel a deep debt of gratitude to all those young indigenous leaders who are now getting slightly older and, and have more young people coming up behind them. You know? so. yeah, no, it's an exciting time, I think, for our country and to maintain the momentum um, of the TRC and the, the work that you've done in, in bringing these issues to, to you, our consciousness. So you know, uh, George Erasmus in the Royal Commission, I mean, I don't know how many of you read the Royal Commission. It's not the shortest document in the world. Um, but it is a brilliantly written document, and it puts everything on the table. 
and then the TRC and, and Senator Sinclair did a fabulous job, fabulous job. At, at, in a way, dealing with another issue, but also reducing it and making it perfectly clear with the recommendations. And there is no excuse for anybody in the country saying they don't understand what's at stake. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's, here's a, maybe we should finish, I think we need to finish, but you know, a lot of people say, um, and again, it's a little bit the same reductionist argument. They say, well, um, well, first of all, reconciliation means nothing without restitution. You know, we're talking about a real transfer of money and power and responsibilities out of the department, out of the government to indigenous people. This has to happen, otherwise there's no reconciliation, I don't think, anyway. Um, but people keep saying, you know, well, if we do this, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna be a sacrifice. You've heard this argument, you know. People are gonna have to give up something. This, this is the, see, it's the same argument as if we save buildings, people are gonna make less money. It's the same reductionist argument. If the indigenous people do well, the non-indigenous people are gonna to have to make a financial sacrifice. That's the stupidest argument I've ever heard. I mean, this is this idea that it's a fixed pie, and if somebody else gets a little bit of your piece, you get less pie. That isn't the way it works. I mean, I, and, and, and uh, you know, the Chilcotin case is a fantastic example. The Chilcotin case for the non-Canadians is you know, one of the most important decisions made by the Supreme Court, which finally clears up a whole thing, bunch of things on sovereignty. Um, and I remember when it was first got through this, what, this is the Supreme Court of British Columbia? Um, and, uh, and I was, I think, in, in Vancouver for, the, for a fair country and speaking to an audience like this. And people had been complaining in the press and saying, oh my God, it's X, I forget, thousand square kilometers and we're gonna lose it. Lose it. I mean, I keep hearing people say, we're gonna lose this land to this small band of First Nations people. So I got up and I, I mean, being a writer, you get to say things, right? <laughs> and so I got up and I said, no, so listen, now you're all here and I just, uh, I've heard all this about the, the decision and, um, and, and so some of you are unhappy that you're gonna lose this land. I mean, I, you're losing it? Aren't they the original owners and inhabitants? How, how are you losing it? I mean, that's where they're from. But, but just let's be clear from a utilitarian point of view, since you say you're unhappy about losing it, how many of you in this room are planning to move to Williams Lake in that area in order to take over? Nobody said a snare to me, just the way you are. And um, I said, so none of you are planning, so how many of you are planning on sending your children or grandchildren to live there to run this place? So since none of you are actually planning on leaving Vancouver to go to this land to take responsibility, aren't you incredibly grateful to these First Nations people who are saying, we're from here, we're gonna stay here and we're gonna look after it? I mean, aren't you grateful to them for that? The pie is bigger by doing that. And what's the other option? You're gonna hand control of this land over to a board of directors of 12 ancient men in New York or Toronto? That's an improvement? You're gonna do better out of that than the First Nations people having control of it and, and, being, and being overseeing how it's developed and what the standards will be? Clearly, everybody in Canada does better by the First Nations people being in control. It gives much more value to what happens in the two thirds of the country, which is not 12 cities in the South. You know? No, it's a really interesting parallel. Great. Well, no, which. Uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want you to just go off that side, maybe? It's always a pleasure to invite um, smart, interesting Canadians into my little living room here. So I just want to thank John Ralston Saul again for his uh, his words. Uh, really a um, mind-opening opportunity for us to think about places um, and the, the models and the systems that we use to manage and protect them in new ways and to think about our country uh, in new ways as well. Uh, I just wanted to mention that John will be signing books, um, A Fair Country Telling Truth About Canada, The Comeback, How Aboriginals Are Reclaiming Power and Influence, and the third one, um, one of his books in the series that he edited, Extraordinary Canadians, on Robert Baldwin and uh, Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine. 
and that will be near the registration area after this event. And so now I would like to hear from Indigenous Voices. I think we all would like to hear from Chief Kirby White Duck and Band Councillor Alice Baudouin, who we met earlier this evening. Uh, and I just want to say that th these people are leaders in their own communities and they have pressing issues to address um, their own destiny to, to uh, manage as a nation. But they're willing to come here and spend time with us and generously share their perspectives and help us understand the ways that they think about territory and, and places and values and history. Uh, so they're here to share with us um, information about uh, this place and their, their own history, their ancestral territory. Uh, so join me, join, join all of us in listening with open hearts and minds and um, do our part as we, uh, as we move together in a spirit of reconciliation. I think, uh, Alice, you're going to start. Great. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you for just speaking so openly and just bluntly like that. I love that. Um, um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm not a, a public speaker that much. However, uh, I, my first uh, public uh, speaking engagement as a band counselor was uh, to a pretty big audience as well. And uh, I was so nervous that I just, you know, just told them I w I'm nervous. Uh, this is my first time speaking in public and my first speech. And, you know, it just made me feel a little bit better. So I'm doing that again tonight. <laughs> and uh, at the end, um, there was this uh, in the audience also sitting at in the front at the, with us was a, a minister from Quebec, some big minister from Quebec. And I live in Quebec and we have a very difficult time with Quebec government uh, with Aboriginal rights. And I was at the end of uh, the presentation, I got uh, a standing ovation, which I was very proud about because I spoke about uh, values, Canadian values, and uh, I think, and the United States values for those who are from the United States, other values, Southern values as you would, would call them probably. Um, um, maybe you can name a few uh, on what those are. Um, respect, honesty, and, and all that stuff. Uh, money. money. Money, it seems to me, is very respected in the South. That's, that's, that's what I see. It's money. And for, for many, many years, Anishinaabe people, uh, that's what we call, uh, I call First Nations people in, on Turtle Island. Uh, we had our own set of values, you know? And uh, I went to this, um, um, this ceremony last weekend, and it was a four day ceremony. And I walked away from this ceremony and I felt so good. This ceremony, um, what they talked about, the, the values of compassion and love, honesty, respect, wisdom, kindness, generosity, and uh, bravery. And our people, Anishinaabe people have been uh, pulled away from this, these values, and we're, we, without really uh, trying, we have supplant, sub, our values have been supplanted by Southern values. And I think, you know, there's a big uh, thing about uh, identity. And um, anyways, I'm rambling on. 
I have a speech. Um, our ancestors uh, were free to travel over our territories, free from such things as borders. Uh, our languages did not have a word uh, for border per se, but we say um, in our language, ka ogji madisek odaki, meaning where a territory begins. And uh, we have been here since uh, time uh, immemorial. Our history is very, uh, very much connected here, uh, the Anishinaabe Algonquin people, Nish people uh, to the Ottawa River. All of North and South America is known by many First Nation people as Turtle Island. Our belief in the spirit of all creation has been one of our guiding principles. We respect the nature of all living things. The life in all of nature has helped us, protected and guided us. The natural cycles of the seasons, the water, animals, trees, and plants has sustained us and kept us healthy. Much has changed, however, as I mentioned. Our land, our role as stewards and caretakers of the land, our beliefs, our model. We had, a, we had our own model as well. Uh, and philosophy have been challenged and changed forever when Europeans first came to Turtle Island as explorers. It's important to talk about the history of the Ottawa River and just give a little bit of uh, information about it. This river has played a major role in shaping where we are at today. The Ottawa River, known traditionally by Anishinaabe peoples as the uh, Kichisibi links from the sea all the way up to St. Lawrence, the Great Lakes, all the way up, up the Nipissing and all the way to James Bay. And these lakes and its tributary Ter tributaries were the Anishinaabe ancestral highway. Our ancestors were nomadic hunters, gatherers, and uh, we lived, hunted, camped, and traded along these shores. We traded with uh, other Anishinaabe nations east and west and into the interior of the Anishinaabe Ottawa River watershed territory. Uh, branching off from the Kichisibi uh, uh, were a number of smaller tributaries that linked nearly 150,000 square kilometers where families established uh, camps and uh, hunting uh, territories. Because of its uh, geographic uh, location, our ancestors strategically established themselves here in Ottawa along the uh, Kichisibi in summer months setting up trade networks. It is said that between 1655 and 1680, the Ottawa or Odawa nation from Georgian Bay area were the only visible nation for, for a time. Um, and this is how the Ottawa, Ottawa got its present name from Odawa. Uh, another source uh, have Algonquins uh, giving it the name Odawe meaning trade. So that's what it means in uh, Algonquin, Anishinaabe. The other Algonquin reserves uh, are uh, Pikwakanagan, Chief Kirby Whitek is from Pikwakanagan, and Wagashuk First Nation. These are both, um, both situated in uh, Ontario. There's Barrier Lake, Grand Lake Victoria, Hunters Point, Kebowick, uh, Laximo, Picogan, Timiskaming, and Long Point and they each got their reserve status at uh, different times. The Kitigan CB uh, uh, band uh, officially became a river desert band, uh, river desert reserve number 18 in 1854. And uh, like uh, Mr. Saul pointed out, it's 130 kilometers north, just outside of this uh, rich area. Uh, with respect to history, we have come a long way. Our ancestors have survived many hardships and, not, and left not only a legacy for archaeologists to uncover. They have passed on uh, traditions, customs, and oral history and a wealth of traditional knowledge. For First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, there is an incredible amount of work uh, that we need to do for our peoples. Whether the issue is health-related, social, judicial, land, treaty, governance, education, language, child welfare, 
you name it. Uh, there's work to do, but who knows better than what needs to be done and what's needs, what, what needs our focus than us. The model that has been thrust upon us has not worked and it's still not working. Um, the history of the Ottawa area is very rich. You will hear from uh, archeologist Ian Badgley, who I recently had the pleasure of meeting. He, uh, he's gonna give you uh, much information about uh, the a uh, lot of uh, artifacts found uh, along the uh, Ottawa River. And uh, you'll hear from the other delegates as well. I'll stop right with that. I'll, I'll end with a story. Um, so in, in history books in, in schools, we're not, uh, t we're only told, we've be, you've been told, our grandparents have been told uh, one part of history. There's another part of history that has not been told very often and it's the First Nations perspective. And um, it's, it's not very pretty. You know, when I do uh, speak, I try not to talk about bad things, but being First Nation, the stuff we have had to deal with, it's, it's pretty hard, you know? And um, my, my skin is not very thick. Uh, as a politician, you know, I, I cry pretty often. <laughs> So uh, this is a story about uh, uh, something that happened along the Ottawa River. It's a, a story told to me from uh, my relatives who live uh, a, a bit further up uh, north, no, more north in uh, my community. It's uh, Barrier Lake, also known as Rapid Lake. Not many of the chiefs uh, back in the day and their people in the uh, 1800s and early 1900s spoke much English or French. As part of uh, the responsibilities of uh, the chiefs, um, they would often, there would often be envoys of chiefs, Ogima and helpers uh, traveling down the river to meet with Wabshkiwe uh, Ogima. That's the um, uh, white chiefs here in Ottawa, perhaps by Victoria Island the chiefs would have their interpreter, interpreters, and one of them was my grandfather, Pierre Wawate. When my grandfather was alive, he recounted hearing stories of the chiefs talking when they came down to Ottawa to meet, to discuss business, to trade, to negotiate, to take care of their people, to do what they had to do. When it was time to depart, it was customary to give uh, to trade or give gifts. Um, there was a time when the gifts uh, given by the Wapshkiwe Ogima included barrels of whiskey or moonshine. As the uh, envoy of Algonquin chiefs left and paddled away to go home, the people who drank this, my ancestors, they died. And uh, this is one of the uh, sad stories, something that you won't, you won't hear in um, your Canadian history books. Jenny Glitch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, it, just before you came on, we talked a bit about whether telling a story like that would be the right thing to do tonight. And we talked about the importance of truth telling, which uh, I think is something we all learned from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So thank you very much for sharing that story with us. You'll have a chance to meet Alice again tomorrow morning at the Indigenous Heritage Roundtable, and you should ask her about her photography. She's an accomplished photographer. Now I'd like to invite Chief Kirby Whitedack 
back to the stage, uh, an Algonquin from Pickwaganigan First Nation uh, in his, I think, ninth year as chief? Oh, 10th, oh my goodness, a long time as chief. Uh, and it's interesting, to, uh, Kirby um, gave us a copy of his book, um, Algonquin Traditional Culture, which details the traditional culture of the Algonquins of the Kitchissippi Valley at the early period of European contact, and it's really an important resource. So I invite you, Chief Kirby, to share some remarks with us tonight. Hello again, everyone. I have a few, uh, uh, what do you call them, PowerPoint slides, I guess, uh, to assist me, give you some visual aids. And I guess I mainly want to talk a bit about, um, about who the Algonquins are, where we were, and where we are, and some, uh, some brief history about, I guess, some of the things that might have happened to us. Um, you've heard a lot of the, well, a lot of you, I assume I've heard things about the, uh, the residential schools, and the horrors that have happened there and the impacts that it has. And uh, it's 60 scoop, and there's been recently um, an apology by the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies. A couple of weeks ago, it was kind of under the radar, but uh, they did make an apology for their role in the scooping up uh, tens of thousands of uh, children, First Nation children uh, from First Nation communities and uh, taking them from their families and the results and uh, impacts of those that are intergenerational. So those are kind of, mod well, I would say modern things, but I want to give a bit about uh, who the Algonquins are. I know that Alice will uh, give you some ideas, and I'll try to give you some visual idea of uh, the, the scope and the extent of our territory. And I do uh, a lot of what uh, John Salson, Ralston Salas said kind of impacted and uh, hit me in a number of spots uh, that, that I found, uh, uh, in my view, accurate. And it, and it kind of reflects also on the Aboriginal people in general, but the Algonquin people also, who I guess we've kind of suffered a similar faith as many other First Nation uh, people across the country. So, without much further ado, here's an historic map. Or a map of historic bands that was put together by the uh, historians Gordon Day and Bruce Trigger in the 70s, I believe, researching uh, probably things like the Jesuit relations of the missionaries who came here in the early 1600s, probably Champlain's journals, other explorers, and where they met Algonquins. So you see the shaded areas like the historic bands up to the, you'll see up on the left, uh, upper left, that's the tip of North Bay, I mean, uh, Lake Nipissing up in North Bay. So you've got the Ottawatomin, the Kitchissippi. So the Ottawa River is originally called the Kitchissippi River. The Kitchissippi. Kitchi is big, Sippy is river. And there was the big river of the Algonquins. So you had the Kitchissippi, who are the uh, big river Algonquins, that present day uh, Morrison Island, about, let's say, 70, 80 miles upriver from here, close to Pembroke. The Matawaska, who are the, uh, the river of the Matawaskarini, uh, going up that watershed and all the tributaries. We've got the Canon, Canon Chipperini, the people of the, of the pike, right in the middle. We've got the West Greeny on the uh, northeast, where the people of the deer, people of the deer. And then on the south, you've got the Anon Chataronan, which is actually a, a Huron word for uh, meaning people of the geese. And there are some other, so those are the ones that were identified in the early early contact period, showing occupation of the, uh, all the what's called now the Ottawa River watershed. And it gives you an idea of the extent of the, of the, the whole territory. Move ahead here. Here's the Ontario side. I'm not sure how accurate, it's fairly accurate, but uh, it shows the, there's about nine and a half million acres and I can't really show you where Ottawa is from here. Um, I don't have a pointer, but the green area is Al Algonquin Park. It's Ontario's largest park. They call it their, their jewel in the crown park. And the majority of that, the great majority of that is in Algonquin territory. 
all the walls read, look, dare I believe? Yeah. Iron Empire Pembroke is up, Pembroke's up here. And I'm talking about Pembroke, so we have the chief testament in the kitchen Zipperini. So uh, John, John was talking about, about Champlain and kind of being lost, the statue on uh, Nepean Point, where it's noted that he was uh, using his astrolabe, but he's holding it upside down in, in that uh, statue. And when he first came up the Ottawa River, he was met by a number of, uh, of um, canal and Chipperini or Gonkins who were going down river. So they're probably, uh, where am I, I'm lost here, somewhere down, further down here. And he asked them for a guide. So the Algonquins, and I think it was 14 canoes of Algonquins going down river. So they exchanged uh, people because the Algonquins said, well, if we give you one of our men, we want one of yours. So anyways, he guided them up, up the river up to Ottawa here, stopped at the falls. The portage side is on the, uh, the Gatineau side because that's the easiest portage route than the, the hills on this side where uh, you have Prowa Hill and the huge hills. And tobacco ceremony is done on the, uh, on the north side of the, uh, the river at the falls. And then he guides them across up by Chenault, currently Chenault up by, uh, between our empire and Pembroke and across a, a chain of lakes. And he probably wouldn't know where to go on that portage, and he would have tried to come up here where the waters become very dangerous and treacherous, and he probably wouldn't have made it. So in, in fact, he was, was, was lost and needed the guidance by the Algonquins who knew, uh, knew the territory. So eventually he makes it up to um, Tessawat, the Kitchisipirini's island, and they control the, the uh, the kitchen city really controls flow of traffic on the Ottawa River. And at Morrison's Island, there's rapids on both sides, the middle of the river. And there's a high point on the east end of the island looking down river, about 60 feet high or so. And so it's, an, it's a lookout spot. And people have to portage because of the rapids. And they would stop anybody coming by. And they would decide whether they're going to charge them a toll or not if they let them through. And so any, even other First Nations, such as the Huron and the Nipissing, they were also subject to a toll for passage through Algonquin territory. So when Champlain made that far, he had, of course, he was looking for a route, I believe it was either to India or China. He was lost, of course. <laughs> and so Chief Tessawat uh, gave him a feast overnight. They, uh, they sat for half an hour, as the, was the custom of the, uh, the Indian, indigenous people in the Algonquins, uh, smoking a pipe for half an hour without saying anything. So I'm not sure to, I understand his French, you know, and it must have had a very difficult time to sit there for half an hour and, and smoke but without saying anything. So he feasted them, gave them uh, a comfort lodging overnight, and then he tried to p continue further up the river, looking for that destination, but he was stopped and Tessawat refused to let him go further. Bit of a story behind that too, but uh, he turned back down the river and eventually headed back to, uh, back to France. So this, this source, the yeah, Algonquin Park in the green here, a couple of million acres of Algonquin territory, and there's a lot of development. This, so this map here shows all kinds of development, transmission lines, hydro lines, some, some settlement. And there's a, there's a lot more development on that territory. This building here sits on unsurrendered Algonquin territory, territory. There's a number of petitions because um, there is no treaty here. It's unsurrendered. One of the few spots, the last spot I believe in Ontario, uh, and uh, uh, other than out west, uh, there's most treaties throughout the uh, the rest of Canada, different interpretations of what those mean, of course. But anyways, um, prior, prior to this, just after the capitulation of the French to the British in 1760, the, uh, the French condition with the British was that one of them was an Article 40 of the capitulation that the Indian analysts of the French should not be molested in their lands if they choose to remain there. And uh, 
I guess some of the Indian nations didn't didn't uh, didn't believe that because, well, people still came into the territory, and they were fighting with the British. A number of them were fighting with the British, and they had a number of forts. They had uh, Fort Detroit and Fort Michilimackinac under siege. Some of them were already taken over, and. So they, they felt they had to do something, and they came out what was called a Royal Proclamation in 1763. That was put out by uh, the King of England, saying that no one can take or settle upon the Indian lands unless the, the nations or tribes agree to that. And the Algonquins were given a copy of that Royal Proclamation, along with 24 other, for other Indian nations, uh, that said that, the king's word and king's promise, that they wouldn't take the lands. And the Algonquins gave a copy, and they carried that around with them for about 84 years, repeating that many, many times in petitions and speeches, live up to the king's word, because it was settlers were coming in, and uh, trappers and hunters, etc., were coming in. So it, they had to do something, and then the petitions began, actually began, nine years after the Royal Proclamation was issued. Now here's one of the petitions, but in that petition, it describes the, uh, the territory. Okay, where do I point this thing? Oh, wrong one. <laughs> so it said, so it's, most of the petitions, particularly great ones, are, are always addressed to the Governor General, who's the Queen's, of course, and the King's representative uh, in the country. And really a uh, different kind of wording. Sir John Colbert, commander of the forces, honorary military of the order, the Bath, lieutenant governor of the province of Canada, etc., etc., etc. The humble memorial of the chiefs and warriors of the Algonquin and Nipissing. The Nipissing were our allies, and a lot of them were kind of amalgamated into the Algonquins. So this, it's a, the, the petition's fairly long, but this, is, this one here, this part kind of talks about, describes the territory. And about the third line down, enjoy this hunting ground, this attractive line lying on the either side of the Ottawa River and Little Rivers, which is the Madewell River, as far as Lake Nipissing, a couple hundred miles or, or, or from here, lying on either side of the Ottawa River, both banks, as far as Lake Nipissing, that is to say, comprehending both banks of the River Ottawa and the River Matawan, called by the voyager the Little River, to the height of land separating the waters of the Lake Nipissing. And those of the Little River, together with the country, is watered by several tributary streams on the River Ottawa, such as uh, the Rideau River and the uh, Gatineau River, the Ronshire, the Madawaska. And the Little River is running north and south from the rivers. That basically says the watershed. Eh? So it's nine and a half million acres on the uh, about that on the Ontario side, and it's about three and a half to four times that big on the uh, on the north side of the river. This was the map. This looks, uh, there was a bit of a background here, here but <laughs> here's the current, uh, current First Nations in the watershed that uh, Alice already mentioned. Algonquin Park, so there's some kind of context there. So Ottawa would be over here somewhere, then you'd have Pembroke, and then the whole kind of the watershed. Unfortunately, there is some background to that map, but I don't see it here. And that's it for the visual. So um, it does show that we're still here and we're still trying to show our presence. If the, if the Royal Proclamation was adhered to, then this territory should not be inhabited other than by Algonquins and I guess whoever we would wish that would else to be here. And the conditions that uh, the, the colonist governments put on about, well, you can only surrender your land to the government and nobody else. So that has never happened, but still, so in the, and the Royal Proclamation is part of Canada's Constitution today, that Royal Proclamation from 1763. And it does say that exact wording. And it's been in there, it's recognized in the 1980 Constitution as re repatriated. But for some reason, that constitutional law has never been, never been followed. And there are still people coming into Algonquin territory, settling it. And there's been no kind of, uh, until very recently, 
consultation and accommodation, and very, very little um, Algonquin say, say or input or partnerships. And it's been, a, a, I guess, the courts have had to, um, as, as some of the Supreme Judges have said, shoot a, shoot, shoot a shot over the bow of the governance because governments then reinterpret the decisions to suit themselves. And so they said, Chilcotin was a shot, no, Chilcotin was a shot over the bow of the government who previous decisions could have been interpreted that the Aboriginal people do have an Aboriginal title. And so that's where uh, things like that, that happen. And I g agree with uh, John here that there should have been a different way of thinking. And it, it, the, just because we have a different way of ownership we have a different style of ownership and a different view of, of how we own the land and how we manage it. But it's not your type of ownership. It's not the type of ownership colonial governments uh, want. So, oh, you don't own it because it doesn't meet our, our, our way of doing things. Whether that's self-serving or not, uh, that's, another, that's another thing. And uh, so we try to tell government, well, the con Constitution still has the Royal Park Proclamation, a lot of proclamation in it of 1763. Why don't you live up to your word now and say the rest, all the unsettled on Papa lands should be recognized as Algonquin lands. And we'll negotiate about compensation and other things around the patented and the occupied lands. But the thinking has to change. And I think maybe it is, and I think there should be some discussion around here about uh, greater involvement and recognition just like I say, like, if you recognize our rights, we would get along a lot better, and just we can just get on with life. But uh, it seems like as soon as our rights are recognized, you see, you have, you have like the, uh, the people going to court for 20, 30 years and spending millions of dollars and people's lives pass while they're in court, and all of a sudden they get recognized by the courts. And it's like should be like a time of celebration and everybody else. And, and if, if non-Aboriginal people's rights are, are recognized, there is celebration. You know, and there's, there's dancing in the street and celebrations and happening. But as soon as Aboriginal people's rights are recognized, what, what happens? Government tries to find a way to get around them and to extinguish them and to not give or accommodate. But I think if, if um, well, the people are the government, if they had a different view that, well, recognize the rights, they're, I, don't, I don't think they're not special rights, they're different rights that pre-existed before, uh, before Europeans came here, recognize them, and then I'm sure we could start working together, working together to hopefully sustainably and responsibly uh, manage the land and the resources and, and the development that occurs. There's hopefully been some discussion that occurs here in this session about how that could be done and that we should be recognized as partners uh, in the development and management and of, of our territories. So hopefully that gives you a bit of insight on the extent of, um, of who the Algonquins are, the extent of the territory, and some history and background. And um, hope it helps you um, helps us in our discussions over the next couple of days. So thank you very much. These are really fundamental heritage issues and it's, it's a privilege for us to have Chief Kirby and Councillor Alice with us to share their history and tell us about their territory. And uh, we're so pleased to have them with us again tomorrow as well for the Indigenous Heritage Roundtable. So thank you so much. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers and we do have gifts for them here at the front. And now I invite APT President Dean Koga to close the evening. Thank you. What an informative
thought-provoking and bracing program. And, and thank you, Natalie, for organizing it and um, setting really high standard for the beginning of the, of the conference. Um, I'm told that there's some housekeeping announcements that are going to be displayed um, on the screen. Um, so there are a couple events starting right now, and um, I just invite you to go forward and enjoy the conference and, and keep thinking. And I don't think you can stop thinking after this program. And um, welcome and enjoy. Thank you.